Foremost news from Southeast Asia. Hello and welcome to Duran ASEAN. You are with Gauri. Welcome back. This is Grace. And this is your ASEAN Daily where we bring you news from all over Southeast Asia. And today, of course, it's a Friday, last day of the week. Uh, and as always, we are back with you with more news uh, from whatever that's happening all over the region. And today we will be starting out with Jakarta, of course, uh, after what happened yesterday, uh, the Jakarta blast that killed at least uh, six people in the city uh, capital. Uh, and Jokowi says that this is an act of terror. Uh, President Joko Widodo has urged all his people to remain calm after uh, people were killed in what he dubbed as acts of terror with fears that militants were still on the run in Jakarta. So what happened um, yesterday was uh, it was about uh, seven people who were killed in the series of uh, bomb and gun attacks in central Jakarta. And then uh, we are, of course, there is a lot of uh, speculation coming out from this incident, and uh, there are also uh, foreigners who are also uh, shot, uh, wounded uh, during the is- this incident, and the people were, most of people were very, very shocked after this happened, and of course, Joko Widodo uh, has announced that uh, to remain calm at mm-hmm. this situation, because we really need to find uh, any possible ISIS claim of this responsibility at this stage. Right, and he uh, also condemned the act, of course, uh, saying that it has disturbed the security and the peace that spread among his people. Uh, apparently, there was some gunfire and explosions uh, that uh, people heard. Uh, and then when they turned and looked around, there was a powerful blast that actually exploded through a Starbucks cafe in the city center, uh, almost near uh, a group of embassies and United Nations right. office and uh, also a nearby police post was be- uh, damaged badly uh, and there was this one gunman who kept firing repeatedly at bystanders and also reloading his weapon as police uh, flooded the street Yes. and uh, following this uh, one of the intelligence chief has actually come forward uh, to say that this is definitely terrorism, but we don't know yet if it's ISIS related, so let's not point any fingers. And Malaysia as well has been on a high security alert because uh, Indonesia is just next to us. And if it is a terrorism attack, it could be uh, easily uh, real, uh, an easy target for the terrorists as well. For sure. After that happened yesterday, right, uh, there was this... Uh, sh- uh, short notice uh, to Malaysia please be careful around the Kelsey area especially and also uh, around the Damansara height because mm-hmm. that's where the UN office is so just be make sure that uh, here the security uh, is tightened up uh, for uh, any attacks in because uh, we never know because mm-hmm. Jakarta like you mentioned it is our neighboring country and it happened and then there is still uh, under investigation to find out what exactly happened. And uh, following up to what you just said, uh, the IGP has also uh, increased security measures, employed (coughs) more police, uh, especially in shopping malls and tourist (coughs) spots, uh, these hot areas. Uh, He also urged people to be more Mm -hmm. uh, cautious when visiting these places. Uh, Of course, there's really nothing much that we can do if, you know, things like this, they just happen out of the blue. Uh, But for now, because uh, we can never be too careful, so let's try to stay away from any any embassies or where there's the United mm-hmm. Nations office. Yep. And following uh, up from the next news, we have uh, Cambodia Muslim School, which is under threat. Uh, Cambodia police have been ordered to stand guard at Cham Muslim School in the wake of a month-long wave of attacks on the site, which has included death threats as well as feces being left in the facility's 
portable water tanks? Well, um, the school uh, was founded by uh, Imam in Tongkum. Tongkumum, a province called Muhammad Abdurrahman, where this school uh, educates and teaches the Cham language, cultural history, and religious practice as well. But it was uh, reported that about 24 of this school students fainted and were they were hospitalized after claiming that the poison gas was allegedly released into the house where they were staying. So it's uh, another uh, quite worrisome issues that's been uh, reported. And uh, not only that, uh, uh-huh. there's also been rocks that was being left uh, in the compound. But on Monday night, one of the rocks was wrapped, wrapped in a piece of paper inscribed with death threats and describing Abdul Rahman and other staff as dogs. Oh, and it uh, seems like we don't uh, really know what's the motive of this yet. And police has not made uh, any arrests so far. But what is clear is that somebody is not too happy about uh, the school uh, being there and the things that they teach. Uh, I mean, it could be something simple as just a charm language, cultural history, like what you mentioned. <laughs> um, right. And uh, it's hard to say uh, why would somebody be against that, especially uh, they're just going against students, really. It's just a group of uh, young people yeah. as well as the imam. Uh, and I think what they can do is also increase the security and make sure that all the students are careful because these days th- threats are everywhere, whether it's a country, a state, can even be a school. Yep. And, and then also so far, uh, we have not heard any uh, police report uh, on the uh, arresting people because uh, according to them, there's no clear motives yet. But uh, when it comes to Southeast Asia, the act or, of a police station or policemen, they are a bit uh, slow, I will say. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it's not really a, a really immediate action that they will put on after certain incidents happen. So this is perhaps a, something that Asia really needs to look at it as well. I think so. I mean, it's concerning the youth uh, of the country. Yeah. And uh, it could be just one school, but uh-huh. if you don't curb the problem right away, it could start spreading out. And before you know it, it's out of control. Exactly. And from there, let's move on to the Philippines. Of course, this um, has to be regarding the elections. And today we will be focusing on uh, one of the candidates, Binai, who was quite silent uh, all this while. And turns out that was actually his strategy uh, (laughs) from ads and sorties. Uh, Spokespersons to the candidate himself said that Binai stuck to a very focused campaign message uh, focusing on poverty. So can he actually continue to evade the corruption allegations? Well, my question here is, mm. is silence really a good uh, strategy <laughs> when it comes to election? I mean, it's really normal mm-hmm. to see uh, participants uh, going around and visit people and make announcements and lot of uh, do a lot of uh, campaigns and promotions. But then, well, according to Binet, he said it is one of his strategies and also uh, for the opposition leader who mm-hmm. suffered from the major corruption scandal and was a series of communication gaps as well. So uh, his silent strategy uh, uh, in the recent months reflects a more organized mm-hmm. and disciplined campaign. So like you said, it's from the ad uh, a sort of sports person to the candidate himself. It wasn't so much that what he said, nothing, but he stuck to the focused campaign message. He even evaded a lot of reporters and he didn't even give much of interviews when he right. had the chance. He would just cut it short uh, and he got his spokespersons busy with all the party work uh, and even when rivals wrote him off and made the loudest noise uh, he all he focused on was trying to uh, see how he can regain his lead in the race uh, and also some analysts said that um, the comeback merely to his opponent's disqualifications cases uh, or to his tireless brainstorming um, <coughs> that could be why one of the reasons why he is remaining silent uh, and I think like what you mentioned earlier the fact that his campaign was more organized more discipline. Uh, it, it does yeah. come of a shock because they all the other candidates are pretty vocal about <laughs> you know what they're doing exactly. and uh, what was their manifesto and uh, even when it comes to uh, calling out each other's candidates and what they are doing wrong, especially yeah. when everybody was really vocal about Grace Paul yep. and her citizenship uh, in the country. Uh, but Binai was one of them who uh, actually chose to stay away from that. Uh, and it seems that the moral cor- problem 
actually it's not corruption the moral problem is poverty that is uh be nice uh main concern when it mm-hmm. comes to the elections and he said this is what i have to face not a fight against all these allegations but a fight to alleviate poverty in the life of every filipino and that actually sounds very very mature very professional coming from him because he knows not to get involved in all these uh, little fights that they're having that is very true well it looks like uh, each candidate they have their own their own uh, focus uh, elements when it comes to uh, elections and I guess Binet's uh, focus is here is like he mentioned is poverty and mm-hmm. in fact the country uh, Philippines has uh, the very high rates when it comes to that particular issue is poverty and that's when he really wants to dig and to, uh, mm-hmm. to find the solutions for this because we see a lot of people in the street and uh, especially kids they're just asleep around right. on the street so that's uh, one of the the poverty concerns that we can talk about and uh, in fact uh, in the country it is hailed as Asia's rising tiger. He uh, himself, Binet's goal is to illustrate that one in four Filipinos lives in the poverty that he mentioned. And that's his constituency, as seen in the December last year survey of Pulse Asia Research Incorporated. And you know what else he did? He actually went down to the people and uh, he started uh, getting to know them, eating with the poor communities. Uh, he was also seen, uh, uh, there was an image of the second highest official hugging senior citizens. Mm-hmm. Uh, and uh, this actually created a very good reputation for himself, where people are now talking about the compassionate Binay presidency. So he's already giving this image that if you vote for me, you'll have a very compassionate, loving right. environment in the country and there will be no poverty. Uh, and uh, he highlights his competence as well as the former local chief executive to brand himself, mm. not just as the best, but the only candidate who will deliver health and education programs. That is very, very clever of him. It is. I it mean, is. ultimately, it always goes down to health and education being uh, two most important elements. For sure. Uh, in a, when it comes to if you are really talking about a people-centered government. For sure. And, uh, well, we wish Binay good luck. And uh, talking about another election, yeah. a bit far from here, we're talking about Taiwan, <coughs> but uh, we're also going to look at how Taiwan's 2016 elections is uh, connected <coughs> to ASEAN and this Saturday actually uh, Taiwan will kick off its 2016 electoral calendar and Mr. Tsai Ing-wen and her Democratic Progressive Party uh, will very likely defeat Mr. Eric Chu and the ruling Kuomintang in both the presidential and legislative races and she announced that the future DPP administration will pursue a new southbound policy in the years ahead and this is when she uh, is looking at strengthening Taiwan's economic and cultural ties with both ASEAN countries as well as India. Well, to talk about this uh, particular policy that you mentioned, mm-hmm. New Southbound Policy, it originates from the former president, Lee yeah. Teng Hui's Go South Policy. And from there, it developed further. She just changed the words. <laughs> yeah, exactly. But it was formally launched in late 1993 mm-hmm. uh, when Taiwan uh, Taiwan's currency was pretty strong and also overseas investment was very lucrative at the same time. And of course, if you you talk about the economic here it was uh, they were pretty at a stable uh, stage there but worried about the the risk uh, inherited in increasing Taiwan's economic uh, interdependence with China he encouraged uh, she encouraged uh, the the Taiwanese companies to expand foreign investment in Southeast Asia so this new southbound uh, policy uh, really works and its attempt to 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 uh, uh, step into this Asian economic uh, hope mm-hmm. that it really, really works out. And uh, according to their previous uh, <coughs> administration under Mr. Ma, he has also conducted a very uh, vast uh, foreign policy under the banner of viable diplomacy. Right. So what he does is uh, it's basically just approach uh, of warming ties with China, also while expanding uh, Taiwan's role in the international arena and also uh, putting Taiwan there as also another potential uh, partner, yeah. especially for countries in ASEAN. Uh, he also traveled to Singapore for the first time uh, since he assumed the presidency to uh, meet with uh, Mr. Lee Sien Long uh, to have some talks with him as well. And from this, we get to see that um, 
it is in ASEAN's interest to see stable uh, cross straits relation, as we would call it. I see. Uh, because it will allow ASEAN to cooperate with countries like Taiwan with lower risk of uh, antagonizing China. Uh, and on the cultural front also, Taiwan uh, should look at continuing to foster its people-to-people connectivity with ASEAN, especially by improving the rights of immigrants and migrant workers. And another thing that they can look at is also promoting tourism, uh, ah. Taiwan tourism in uh, Southeast Asia. Right. So uh, towards these elections, there are lots of things that we can expect from Taiwan. And in fact, uh, like you mentioned, China and Taiwan, they have a pretty a good relationship when it comes to uh, their trade industry. And then, um, I mean, uh, the country, China, has become Taiwan, uh, Taiwan's largest export destination since 2002. So hope that uh, towards this election, um, I mean, also the, regarding the ASEAN Economic Community, we can talk about lots of things here True. that uh, uh, Taiwan's 2016 election mm-hmm. uh, can help a bit more uh, when it comes to ASEAN community and also uh, having the right leader for this nation is also very important that who's going to contribute and lead mm-hmm. and to be part of the ASEAN community. You know what, I think what they should do is uh, follow what Japan and South Korea did and try to grant a visa-free access uh, uh, to most countries in Southeast Asia. All right. For example, like Thailand, Brunei, or Indonesia. And, uh, well, I think Taiwan's uh, Go South policy is just in time because right. we just launched the uh, ASEAN Economic Community. Uh-huh. We're looking at an ASEAN integration. And I think ASEAN would be happy to welcome uh, Thailand, uh, sorry, Taiwan yeah. <laughs> uh, into the group as well. For sure. So let's take a short break. When yep. we come back, we will talk about the economy side as well as the arts and culture part of Southeast Asia. <laughs> ASEAN Dailies, first and foremost news from Southeast Asia. Hello and welcome back to Duran ASEAN, you're with Gauri and Grace. And this is of course your ASEAN Daily where we bring you news from all over Southeast Asia. And for this part, we are going to move on to the economy side and uh, as well as the arts and culture of Southeast Asia. But starting with the uh, economy side, uh, something is being smuggled uh, from Myanmar into China, and it's actually white sugar. Right. And uh, it's becoming one of the most uh, smuggled item. Uh, strong flows of white sugar are moving from India and Thailand uh, to Myanmar and a fast-growing destination. Uh, and much of that is believed to be smuggled into China, uh, the sources said. Uh, and there was a clampdown against uh, raw sugar import licenses by Chinese authorities, disappointing a start to the Chinese harvest due to adverse weather and uh, as well as high import margins into China that have sort of spurred on this smuggling trade. When it comes to smuggling stuff, uh, there are so many, uh, I will say, elements or ingredients that's been smuggled into China so far. Mm-hmm. And that's, of course, from uh, ASEAN countries. And that includes uh, Thailand, Myanmar, as well as India. And um, it's not something new. It's been going on for some time. There was no uh, such policy or regulations that we can lessen it or stop these uh, uh, the activities. And in fact, the Chinese, uh, uh, the strong Chinese demand has contributed to pushing up these uh, white over rose uh, premiums on the intercontinental exchange to an excess of about hundred dollars per ton. This uh, uh, we're talking about this week, and it is very comfortable margin for refiners. And and white sugar is also believed to be smuggled into China via Laos and Cambodia, uh, according to the sources. And shipments from Thailand to Myanmar and Laos have been very, very heavy in the last couple of months, said a Western analyst. And that's another route uh, to China. Uh, we also have uh, white sugar was quoted to be about $420 per ton delivered to the Chinese border. Wow. And uh, domestic prices in uh 
actually in excess of $800 per ton. Oh dear. And Myanmar is actually the leading conduit for smuggled sugar uh, uh, traders as, uh, as well, according to the analysts. Uh, Myanmar was a major destination for white sugar. So uh, what's happening here is that all this sugar is being uh, smuggled into Myanmar and China. So I was wrong earlier when I said from <laughs> Myanmar. Uh, and uh, the destination for the white sugar, of course, Myanmar being one of the hotspots, importing at least less than 50,000 tons, the Western analyst said. And Myanmar could actually import more than 1 million tons in this year, 2015-2016. Correct. Added. Well, you talk about a shipment, uh, the how they've been uh, smuggling all this white sugar uh, into China and you talked about the Myanmar as well. So basically from Thailand to Myanmar and also uh, we're including Laos as well, they have been very, very heavy in the last couple of months, the activities, and that that's another route into China as well. And in fact, the South Chi- uh, I'm sorry, Southeast Asia-based trader uh, mentioned that the last year there was more than 1.5 million tons were smuggled into China and it was not possible to verify mm-hmm. the figure independently. Right. Uh, and I mean, if sugar is really that important and uh, it needs to be sent to other countries, I'm sure they can work, work out a way to do it instead of smuggling. Uh, of course, they're probably getting a lot more money that is not being regulated yet, uh, but it's also becoming a major problem for ASEAN economically. Yep. And uh, moving on to uh, Vietnam, we have AEC that uh, could potentially provide 14.5% more jobs by 2025, uh, according to uh, this uh, research study uh, conducted by the International Labour Organization. They said that jobs in Vietnam will increase by 14.5% thanks to the country's participation in the AEC, uh, especially due to the current development gap. A lot of skilled laborers uh, are actually moving to more developed countries like Malaysia, uh, Singapore and Thailand. Uh, So the ones who remain back in Vietnam are actually uh, those who have very low level qualifications. Right. Well, having uh, skilled laborers in Southeast Asia and uh, just the other day we talked about Indonesia, how they want to uh, contribute uh, the nation when it comes to AC, uh, mainly because of the population. Now AEC can benefit uh, another nation, which is Vietnam. And when you talk about uh, the benefit and also how AEC can provide this figure they mentioned, 14.5% mm-hmm. more jobs, is according to the survey, ASEAN businesses are now concerned actually about the shortage of skilled labor after this establishment. That's why the about 50% of ASEAN employers said Both manual workers and those with university degrees do not satisfy job uh, qualification requirement recently. Right. And I think when it comes to a country, uh, when we talk about the future, we always talk about the youth. uh, And brain drain is actually one of the most common things that we're facing in Southeast Asia. Look at Malaysia. Even Singapore had that problem uh, at one time. Uh, But that was just because of a different reason. And looking at this, if at a country, less developed countries, when you look at Vietnam, Cambodia, uh, Myanmar, Laos, I think when you have that certain uh, qualification or you have that certain stature, you have the skills, you want to move on to a place that pays you more. And that's a completely normal instinct for most people. Mm -hmm. So what uh, Vietnam uh, should look at here, uh, I think they are already doing a few things like coming up with some uh, government agencies, uh, meeting up with policymakers, and also entering enterprises who must provide special attention and very carefully craft out uh, a program on how they can improve their human resource uh, competitiveness and also at the same time supporting this free flow of uh, labor who are moving around to all the different ASEAN countries. Right. I mean, of course, when we talk about AEC, we want people to be moving around, yep. but uh, I think at the same time, they want to also retain uh, a certain amount of uh, skilled workers in their own country to mm-hmm. work on uh, 
to improve their own economy as well. Yes, and then again, we are talking about Vietnam here. Uh, Vietnam has also has its own gap when it comes to education and also economic gap. However, uh, with AEC, uh, hopefully there is a uh, connectivity within and also outside of ASEAN, and also uh, there uh, is a shift economic and labor structures capitalize on the competitive edges, improve manpower quality, and also definitely manage the labor market. So those are the very important elements that we shouldn't neglect when it comes to AEC. And AEC do include all these 10 nations and mm -hmm. hope that it can benefit all the nations and also we can achieve. Um, we, it doesn't need to be really huge, uh, ambitious dream, but at least to satisfy a few uh, elements and also industries in certain countries, it's actually good uh, enough, I mean, good start to uh, just kick off this AEC. Right, and let's move on to the arts and culture part of Southeast Asia. <coughs> we have a very, very interesting uh, news here where uh, Penny Girls Coleman, Keith Williams, discovers that his father was the third Sultan of Para in Malaysia. <laughs> Just imagine waking up one day and realizing that you're actually the son or the daughter of a sultan in a country somewhere. Exactly. Well, uh, Penny Gross, man who was adopted uh, as toddler more mm -hmm. than 60 years ago, has discovered that, like you mentioned, he is the eldest son of a Malaysian sultan. But my question is, why was he adopted <laughs> from the first place? What, what went wrong here? <laughs> I think uh, a lot of things... Uh, <coughs> not, not went wrong, but a lot of things happened uh, during his uh, childhood. Right. Well, first of all, he had uh, he's 64 years old and he had no idea about his origins, especially his royal origins. Oh, right. Uh, that's when he started tracing uh, for his biological parents. Uh, and while he was at it, he discovered a story more suited to fairy tales uh, than life as a coal merchant. And he found out that uh, he was actually uh, the son um, of the Sultan in Para. Uh, and he has been spending more than 20 years working in his adopted father's coal business. Mm. Uh, and then later he felt like he just needed to know who he was. Uh, he wanted to find his own identity. Uh, and uh, he actually managed to trace his biological mother first, Elizabeth Rosa, in the Peterborough area. And she was the one who told him that All her right. father was actually a member of the Malaysian monarchy, who also ter served as the 33rd Sultan of Para after returning to his homeland from the UK. So there we go. Perhaps uh, we all should know our <laughs> uh, <laughs> family background and also perhaps uh, important to trace our history, family history and see. You never know <laughs> what we can find Absolutely. out. Absolutely. And uh, well, he uh, he's not going to be making any claims to the throne. Yeah. So we <laughs> I think the Sultans <laughs> have nothing to worry about. Uh, but he's quite sensitive about it. And yeah. uh, I think he uh, is also visiting his father's tomb and uh, the whole experience for him uh, would be quite surreal because he never thought he would get to go over to Malaysia to exactly. find out about his father. I mean, imagine you're a coal merchant in the UK and the next thing you know that your father's all the way in Malaysia, <laughs> you know, this country above Singapore, as they all <laughs> call it. And uh, from there, moving on to the next one, uh, I think this is very cute news I would say we okay. have a lot of elderly uh, people in Lao actually buying smartphones not knowing how to use it just because they want to you know stay up to date with the latest technology <laughs> well you mentioned it's cute but it's also sad because mm. most of them they don't know how to use it they have the smartphone perhaps it's a all this vibe and trend and the obsession obsession with the social media and stuff but then well this technology is moving quite rapidly these days of course yeah. and many old people they're struggling to come to grip with this is <laughs> a simple task uh, perhaps like taking pictures and post it on the, on the social media even the, uploading the videos well it could be a, a bit challenging for them because um, once it's very fast and automatic, so for them, while well, the, those days everything was manual based, mm -hmm. uh, they're maybe not, you know, even get used to all these uh, new uh, uh, app applications and even do on the just touch on the screen and everything works. Yeah, so it's for them, it could be very new. Yeah, and it also shows how far technology <coughs> has 
seep into our lives. I mean, uh, at one point it used to be a luxury when it comes to smartphones, but now, of course, everybody has one. You don't even question it. Exactly. Uh, and I'm pretty sure that uh, the older generation will want to keep up uh, with that as well. <laughs> uh, I mean, of, of course, they may not know how to do it, but they still are interested in uh, <laughs> knowing what are all these kids talking about. Like, what is Facebook? What is WhatsApp? What is WeChat? And how can they uh, get into that as well? Uh, and they also feel like they're missing out on something if they actually don't join the Aww. sort of perceived fun on social media. Right. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, well, I uh, hope they will... To, they can turn to their kids or what to teach them but then again I I might sound a bit cheesy but hey technology is not everything <laughs> you guys had a good childhood a good life stay away from technology <laughs> really and uh, moving on to the next news which is uh Quite a saddening news, especially it came uh, just after the death of another huge music legend. We are talking about the passing of Alan Rickman, who is a much-loved uh, stage, TV and film star, uh, including films like Harry Potter and Die Hard. And he passed away yesterday as well at the age of 69. Well, uh, this star, whose art, uh, arch features and language addiction were recognizable across the generation. So Rickman found a fresh legion of fans with his role as Professor mm. Snape in the Harry Potter films. And we do remember who he is and then his contribution uh, uh, in the film industry as well as music. Mm -hmm. And I think uh, that's actually two of his most, fa most uh, famous uh, characters that he played. Mm -hmm. One is uh, Professor Snape in Harry Potter and one is actually uh, Hans Gruber in oh, right. uh, Bruce Willis, uh, <coughs> together with Bruce Willis in Die Hard. <coughs> Uh, and <clears throat> the cast and crew of these two movies have been uh, voicing their uh, disappointment and uh, how sad they are, uh, calling him one of the loyalest and most supportive people they've ever met. This was according to, of course, Daniel Radcliffe, uh, who played Harry Potter mm. uh, in the movies. And I think it's definitely another major, major loss uh, for the entertainment industry because it's very rare that you come across an actor who is so, so committed to what he's doing, uh, especially yeah. someone who is so diverse, who could do films, TV, as well as stage. Yes. So multi-talented person, uh, we, we will remember him as who he was and also how he he uh, his contribution to to the film industry especially right uh, that'll be all for us today thank you so much for listening to our ASEAN daily so don't forget to follow us on Facebook Twitter Instagram and subscribe to our YouTube channel for all the daily podcasts don't forget to visit our website drianasean.com and when you're on the go do download our Drian app so you can use listen to us <laughs> 